pleased that the city's sort of taken a little moment to remember the steamship Savannah and its importance not only to Savannah's history, but international maritime history. Um, we're approaching its 20th, I'm sorry, 200th anniversary um, next week on Maritime Day, May 22nd. That's the day that it sailed from the port of Savannah in 1819. And today we're going to have the story of the steamship Savannah shared with us by Captain Moses Rogers. Captain Rogers is going to be portrayed by Bob, Bobby Hughes, an interpreter with the Ships of the Sea Maritime Museum. Mr. Hughes is a native of California, served in the United States Army and the United States Army Reserve with one combat tour in Iraq. He has been involved with living history programs since he was in middle school. And he has worked with the Ships of the Sea Museum for seven years, filling what is obviously a lifelong dream of working in the museum and history field. His primary interests include the American Civil War, the American whaling industry, and of course, our steamship Savannah. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Captain Rogers. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Ms. Brick, for inviting me back. 200 years of the future here. And I do apologize for having to use my notes, but um, 200 years does dull a memory. <laughs> uh, as for myself, I was actually born in January of 1779 in New London, Connecticut, uh, to Amos and Sarah Rogers. At a young age, uh, we actually moved across the Thames River to Groton, and my father was actually a uh, <coughs> coastal sea, sea uh, uh, pardon me, a uh, coastal sea captain before opening a lumber and brickyard. Um, at a young age, I knew I wanted to follow his footsteps at sea, and by 21, I was master of my own vessel. Uh, four years later, I met my uh, wife Adelia, married, and her understanding as, wife, as the daughter of a sea captain was very beneficial, as over the next five years, I would hold various sailing commands. Uh, in 1807, however, my life changed forever. I was in New York and happened to see Fulton's Steamboat, or as some called it, Fulton's Folly, steaming up the East River in New York, and at that point I knew that steam was the future. By 1809, I was captain of, master of uh, my own steamship, the Phoenix, uh, working the Delaware River. And then between eight, 1809 and 1818, I actually held five steam commands. Uh, I did uh, make five trans uh, open water voyages, three of those between Charleston and Savannah itself. And it's in May of 1818 that my connection with the steamship Savannah begins. At that time, I was employed by the Charleston Steamboat Company as master of the Steamboat Charleston, uh, running regular packet service between that city and the city of Savannah. Uh, this Charleston would arrive every Monday and depart every Tuesday on time. Uh, it was during uh, my service with them that I began, uh, I'm sorry, sorry. Was my, uh, my experience with those boats got me to the attention of William Scarborough and the other investors of the Savannah Steamboat Company of Georgia. Uh, through conversations with these very, very forward-looking men, uh, the idea of a transatlantic steamship began to take shape. My voyages between Charleston and Savannah had shown that short packet trips by steamboat on the open sea were perfectly safe, and the next step was to show that steam vessels could safely make longer oceanic voyages. On May 6th of 1818, the books were opened here in Savannah for investors for the Savannah Steamship Company with the announcement that a new steamship packet would run from Savannah to Liverpool under my supervision, direction, and navigation. With one hour of the opening of the, the uh, subscription, 250 of the 500 shares available had been taken. I was the sixth to invest. Uh, there was much discussion as to the type of rig of the ship, where to build it, and it was decided to uh, decided to use a full rig ship and to <clears throat> and to build or seek a uh, an in progress hall in New York. On May 23rd, I made my final transit in the Charleston and proceeded directly to New York City where I was able to find an unfinished ship 
at the Fickett and Crockett shipyards, which was quickly acquired. Contracts were also negotiated with the different ironworks for the engine and boilers. The ships would have full rig of sail, produced by my nephew, Stevens Rogers, who would also serve as sailing master and mate. In an effort to economize with the supplies, uh, they were ordered directly from the contractors rather than through the shipyards. And then on August 22nd, 1818, as the, the Savannah, as the vessel was now named, was at last launched. As to the most peculiar part of the ship, it was so revolutionary as the ship itself. There were two boilers, 25 feet in length, six feet in diameter, providing steam to a single cylinder to which was also attached an air pump. The boiler, excuse me, I look at my notes again. Oh yes, the boiler was encased in walls and a floor of brick. Oh yes, the boilers themselves were made of iron instead of the usual copper. The cylinder itself was fully 40 inches in diameter and 5 feet inches deep the largest cylinder yet installed on any steam vessel. The engine would be mounted internally in an unusual 25 degree angle, having the effect of reducing the center of gravity, lateral motion, exposure of the machinery to weather, noise, and vibration. The machinery would generate some 75 horsepower. The paddle wheels were of unique construction being made of largely iron with chain between the paddle buckets, making them both stronger and easy to repair and collapse in case of needing to be repaired. Paddle boxes on the wheels were eliminated to increase stability. The funnel stood 15 feet from the deck uh, with a, after having a 25 degree angle at the upper part, which was mounted on a swivel to direct smoke and cinders away from the sails. Savannah was designed for passenger service, and the main cabins were divided between men and women, <clears throat> richly decorated with mahogany and mirrors, and could accommodate between 25 and 60 passengers. Raising a crew was by far the most difficult of tasks. Given the nature of the vessel, the word along the waterfront gave the most unfortunate of sobriquets the steam coffin. I was obliged to send Stevens to New London, where our family name would lend weight and reputation, and we were able to raise a diverse and willing crew of sailors. March 3rd, 1819, we began putting Savannah through a series of test runs, and a local New York paper announced, she sails to admiration, and her velocity is such to gain entire satisfaction. Finally, on March 28th, we set sail from New York under the old mode, under sail, to avoid offending the Fulton and Livingstons, whose monopoly had held on the steam navigation in that area. <clears throat> Alternating between steam and sail and encountering very rough weather, we proceeded to Tybee Light on Monday, April 6th. We paddled over the bar and caught the pilot completely by surprise was not expecting us to cross the bar without waiting for wind. To cheering crowds, <clears throat> which we would find replicated again and again, one more voyage, we arrived in the city of Savannah. Nine days late due to weather and the new na nature of the ship and the crew, I, however, take all responsibility upon myself. In mid-April, we carried 12 passengers to Charleston and remained there some two weeks in anticipation of carrying His Excellency President James Monroe to Savannah. Unfortunately, President Monroe declined, telling Stevens, the people of Charleston do not wish for me to depart the state in a Georgia conveyance. Mr. Monroe arrived in Savannah overland on the 8th instant of May, and on the 11th, I welcomed him and his party aboard for a short cruise to Tybee Island. On our return, the tide had ebbed 
and he was uh, probably returned on a lighter craft, uh, lighter craft steamboat. We arrived early in the evening. On May 22nd, 1819, we departed. We cleared Savannah for St. Petersburg, Russia, much to the shock of everyone there. But the owners had decided uh, most likely to sell the ship the vessel prior to actually becoming a packet. The economic depression had uh, forced that decision, and selling it in Europe seemed the better option. Uh, we were forced by weather to anchor at Tybee and wait to cross the bar until the morning of the 24th. 21 days later, June 17th, we sighted Cape Clear Island on the southern coast of Ireland. The Telegraph Semaphore reported a ship, the Savannah, a fire at sea, having sighted the smoke rising from our funnel, a sight they were decidedly unfamiliar with. A British revenue cutter, the Kite, was dispatched to our aid. The Kite, a fast sailor, pursued us some time, and they having fired several warning shots in our direction, I was obliged to heave too. Her captain, a Lieutenant Bowie, came aboard and amazed at what he found and pressed me for my destination. I thought at first to stop at Cork City or Kinsale, but the news we may have required assistance uh, may reach home, I decided on the spot to continue to Liverpool, and so decided with an ultimate destination of St. Petersburg. The next day found our, us becalmed and out of coal. After day, a few days later, we found the mouth of the River Mercy and our second encounter with His Majesty's Navy. As we waited to drift a pilot, a gig from a man of war approached and hailed Stevens Rogers, my nephew. The conversation was entertaining. Where is your master, sir? The officer asked. I have no master, sir, was Stevens' reply. Where is your captain, then? He is below. Do you wish to see him? I do, sir, said the British officer. Having heard this as I was coming on deck, I inquired as to what exactly he wished. Why do you wear that pennant, sir, was his reply, referring to one of our flags. Because my country allows me to. He then became rather testy and replied, my captain think it was done, thinks it was done as insult to him, and if you don't take it down, he will send a force to do it. I then told our engineer, get the hot water engine ready. The warning had its effect, and the last we saw of John Bull, he was pulling as hard as he could for his own ship. Truth must out, there was no such engine on board unless one scouts the steam engine itself. After this, I ordered steam up using the remaining of our kindling wood, and we finally made Liverpool. Our estimates timed for the Atlantic was between 21 and 28 days, depending on how one measures. We arrived with little issue with the ship itself, and to the cheers and well wishes of the town. <coughs> Pardon me. To say Savannah created a stir would be, uh, would be justified. Most of the attention favorable, though the ridiculous rumor that we were actually underway to rescue Bonaparte and take him to America did float around. I myself paid calls on the representatives of our own government, as well as that of Sweden and Russia. On July 14th, we provisioned, and on July 16th, took on coal some 35 tons, to which an application to waive duty had been rejected. Two days were spent getting a, birth, a bill of health and in clearing customs. And on the 21st, a mishap with a broken anchor caused a delay, and on the 23rd, we finally dis departed Liverpool. Once clear of Hollyhead, we stopped the engine and sailed north. Uh, after locating the route, <coughs> pardon me, after varying between sail and steam, we rounded the uh, north of Scotland. Uh, we sighted the coast of Norway on the 1st of August, and for seven days we fought strong winds. The storms 
abated on the 8th, and though we sighted the Swedish coast, we were diverted to Elsinore, Denmark, where we were held four days in quarantine as a British Bill of Health was found to be insufficient as a Danish or Russian Bill of Health was required. Once cleared and released, we again encountered rough weather, and it was not until the 18th of August that the engine could be restarted. Three days later, we steamed into Stockholm, again to a warm and enthusiastic welcome. Over our time there, we were visited by the Crown Prince and the people of the city. On September 1st, we took a five-hour cruise of distinguished visitors and Swedish government officials. The King of Sweden made us a most generous offer of $100,000 for the Savannah. But as it was all in the commodities of hemp and iron ore and not specie, I de deemed it not in the interests of our owners and was forced to decline. Refueling, the king was gracious enough to waive any duties on wood, but again, like the British, not on coal. In an effort to economize, we took on more wood than coal, and two weeks after our arrival, departed for St. Petersburg. Our boiler had some difficulty with the wet and unseasoned wood, but after 95 hours, 24 of that under steam, we arrived at Kronstadt. We waited there some five days awaiting for the arrival of Tsar Alexander from his visit to the Finnish frontier. On his return, we steamed for St. Petersburg, making the 14 miles in about an hour and at an unheard of 10 knots. After the usual round of official visits, we took yet another diplomatic cruise on September 21st. We cruised about for four hours with a party of Russian officials on board for trials, evaluations, and observation. The Russians found little fault in our ship, and every confidence was held in their coming to an agreement. It was on the 22nd that those hopes were dashed, when the Lord High Admiral of the Russian Navy wrote, the Savannah cannot be used for a military or commercial ship because this does not have enough room for either the placing of cannon or cargo. Tsar Alexander made us the gracious offer to grant us license to operate the ship in Russian waters, but again, this, is, this was not in the interest of the owners. I was again obliged to refuse. After awaiting out storms until the 10th of October, we steamed out for Kronstadt and at 9 o'clock in the morning. We then set sail for the United States, making the entire voyage under spread canvas. Dawn of the morning of November 3rd, 1819, revealed to us the well-known sight of Tybee Light. At 9 o'clock a.m., we took on a pilot and crossed the bar into the Savannah River. A low tide again forced us to, to wait, and we reached our namesake city early in the evening. Mooring lines run out, and Savannah was at last home. On December 1st, I gave the crew shore liberty, and I was proud to report the following about the Savannah. Had suffered not a screw, bolt, or rope yarn parted, though she experienced very rough weather. Uh, we didn't stay but a few days, and on December 1st, 3rd, we cast off and steamed down to Five Fathom Hole, and the next morning steamed down to Tybee, released our pilot with the engine stopped, and course made for Washington, D.C., departing Savannah forever. Two weeks later, we were steaming up the Potomac River, and by late afternoon, December 14th, we were moored in Washington, D.C., there, with a letter of credit from Mr. Scarborough, I was able to finally pay off the crew and begin to try and sell the Savannah. Through most of December and January, I repeatedly tried, but was frustrated by the Navy having its own design ideas and the Treasury having no use of a ship of her size. To add to the frustrations, word reached us of January 11, 1820 fire that devastated parts of Savannah. On January 24th, Mr. William Smith, from whom I had procured funds 
filed suit against Mr. Scarborough as president of the Savannah Steamship Company. And her, the sole asset, the steamship Savannah, was seized. In February, I returned to New York with no prospects, my investment seized, and empty-handed. On March 1st, I submitted an advertisement for the sale of the Savannah. By March 22nd, the first of three lawsuits was filed by our contractors against the owners, the company, and the ship itself. The debts amounted to $17,200 against an assessed value of $19,510. August of 1820 saw Savannah condemned by the courts and part of her and put up for disposal at auction and the ship sold to Nathan Holdridge for some $6,000. Her revolutionary engine and paddle wheels removed, she became just another sailing packet. As to myself, we were moved to Philadelphia, uh, where I enjoyed the company of my family for some while. By the autumn of 1820, I was able to secure employment again in South Carolina by taking command of the 111-ton steamer PD operating on the PD River in North South Carolina. I was never to hear of the wreck of the Savannah off Fire Island on November 5th, 1821. Now stepping out of character very quickly, uh, Captain Rogers actually passed away Thursday, November 15th, 1821, 10 days after the wreck of the Savannah. Uh, from her time between 1818 and 1821, Savannah operated under steam for some 324 hours. When y'all left Russia, it was under canvas the whole way? Yes, ma'am. Why is that? Economy. And also, Savannah was not a very large ship. She was only some 93 feet long. And her coal carrying capacity was lighter than uh, uh, later on ocean going steamships, which is why she ran her engines for only, only probably about between 80 and 100 hours on the transatlantic voyage itself. Um, with all the duties having to be paid on coal in England and in Britain, or, I'm sorry, in uh, Sweden, they just didn't want to spend the money. There was, money was dear by 1820. Uh, can you put the SS Savannah in the context of other steamships? I mean, uh, the age of steamships, and again, I don't know this, I think it's probably 50, 60 years later. And the first steamships were, you already mentioned, there were already steamships there. Uh, in the, the, big, the, the SS Savannah was simply the first transatlantic steamship. Correct. The work. I'm wondering if you could put the SS Savannah uh, in, in, in a timeline there between sort of the age of steamships and the first steamship. Steamboats uh, had really been op in operational since about 1798 or so. Fulton actually developed the first funk, really practical steamboat, uh, Fulton's Folly as they called it, or the uh, North River Steamboat, or the Claremont. After that, steamboats became very common. Steamships, Savannah would be the first. Prior to that, every, the big scary ocean, <laughs> they didn't think the steamships were capable, they thought they were more dangerous. Boiler explosions, were an extremely common function feature from the very first steamboats all the way up until about 1865 was one of the biggest steamboat explosions in American history, uh, the Sultana. Savannah was the first actual full sailing ship propelled by steam. I'm sorry, I just don't understand. I'm not a maritime person as much, but you say that SS Savannah was the first steam ship. Correct. There were steam boats before. Correct. What is the difference between a boat and a ship? And, and this, this Ocean going. Ocean going. Oh. All right. Yes, ma'am. So, also, not being very well versed in, in uh, maritime <laughs> history, um, it seems like the captain 
really was more than a captain. It seems like from your description that he really did oversee all of the work and the construction and even had a hand in the financing and even to the extent of, and maybe this is where he went wrong, um, getting setting the itinerary and attracting passengers. Is that correct, that he did, really did all of that? Captain Rogers was involved in a lot when it came to the Savannah. And yes, he was involved in the building of the ship. It was his idea, a large part of it was his idea. He sold it on the other investors, Mr. Scarborough and the Andrew Lowe and company, about 23 investors total. And when he, she sailed, she actually sailed with no passengers whatsoever when she set across the Atlantic. There's speculation that that was actually Roger's idea. With this being the first time a steamship crossed the Atlantic, he wanted one less thing to worry about. Um, but is that the failure? Because it seems like they did all the right things and it was so revolutionary but if they didn't promote it to the public, who still didn't trust it, I and mean, they, they worked to get the sailors on board in order to, you know, they had to dispel a lot of the fear of going on a steamship. Yeah. But the idea that they were creating a, a steamship that was ocean worthy and yet was not really designed for the cargo haul that would bring in um, money. Really, the only way to make money off of this venture, it seems, would have been as a passenger ship. Did they just get the messaging wrong, or they were too early for their time, or was it just a, a failed um, a, a failed vision? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. Where the failure occurred was not with the ship itself or with the planning of the voyages. Where the ship failed was the financial crisis of 1818 to 1820. Um, it was when that took place that the investors, before she even set sail, had decided to sell her. They wanted to recoup their losses in the face of what was essentially a depression at the time, caused by uh, insecurity in the Western banks at first, which then spread nationwide. They had actually decided before she even set sail from Savannah to sell her in an attempt to recoup their money. What went wrong was with the King of Sweden only offering commodities in trade, $100,000 in commodities, which when landed on this shore, because of the economic downturn, that $100,000 in property probably would have been worth no, no more than $40,000. And the ship itself cost $66,000 to construct. Um, I'll make a comment and then I have a question. The in the early steamboats, the machinery was so inefficient that they basically couldn't carry enough of wood or coal to make an Atlantic crossing, so they were confined to the coastal areas um, where they could readily take on coal and wood um, often. Um, so that's my comment. My question is, you see pictures like that one up there, and there's a model in the ships of the Sea Museum mm -hmm. of the Savannah. Are, are there contemporary accurate plans and drawings or pictures of the ship? Um, in other words, the question is, are drawings like that accurate? Uh, that drawing itself is not accurate. Uh, the paddle wheel itself, you, it looks for it's a little more solid like you would see on a normal steamboat. Right. It doesn't have the chains. It doesn't have the chains and those wheels <laughs> that you've seen right there are not collapsible. Uh, the other is, the funnel is straight up where Savannah's did have a 25 degree bend at the top of the funnel, allow, which was on a swivel, allowing it to be uh, directed away from the sails to uh, prevent un, uh, unfortunate circumstances caused by smoke and uh, cinders. That answer your question, sir? Well, um, are there contemporary plans or pictures of the Savannah that accurately depict what it looked like? Or not that we're, as far as plans, not that we're aware of. Just have descriptions. There's a um, I'm a Wendy curator of Ships at Sea. There, um, Howard Chappelle was a maritime curator for the Smithsonian Institution, and he developed um, a model based on um, historic writings and um, by this one Frenchman who visited the Savannah. Um, and so 
we know that that, based on those historic writings, that his drawings were fairly accurate. The one thing that he got that wrong, um, according to recent research, is that he thought the coppers, the boilers were made out of copper. Um, and we now know they were actually made out of iron and that the ship itself, the hull, was copper plated. Um, so that's, that's the only thing. Our, our vessel, our model in Savannah in the museum is, is, is fairly accurate according to the Chappelle drawings and the um, historic information, yes. Were you, were you limited as to the weather conditions when you could generate the steam or, I mean, did, did you have to have a certain, seas have to be calm or? Ideally, seas are, should be calmer. Uh, Higher seas are going to cause it to rock back and forth, put, dipping the paddles alternately out of the water. Right. So it would be a little bit less efficient. Um, so yes, calmer seas are a little bit more effect, uh, efficient for running the steam engine, yes. In describing the uh, steam engine, you mentioned it had an attached blower. Mm -hmm. Is that to stoke the boiler? Yes. I'm still trying to figure out under what conditions. And all right, so we have the piece about the depression, mm -hmm. um, and so a loss of faith of the back financial backers. Um, but under what conditions this idea, which seemed very revolutionary, would have been successful? So is there is there something other than the possibility of getting paid passengers to have be part of the maiden voyage? Um, is there is there something that they totally missed that later steam captains picked up on, or was it just that it was before its time because people really needed freight ships and this really was not designed for that? No, she was designed for passenger service. For passenger service. Uh, like I said, what caused the investors to decide to sell her in Europe even before she sailed on May 22nd? was the economic downturn. They were, they were cash strapped. Everybody was cash strapped. And there, so much money had gone into the Savannah that they needed to recoup and basically liquidate their asset. Unfortunately, that was where, where things went wrong. The ship itself was a resounding success. She proved you could sail across the Atlantic under steam power safely. You could sail around England around the UK safely. You could sail into the Baltic safely under steam. The big problem was financial backing or the strength of the dollar. Uh, if you take steamship the, the Savannah in 1818, 1820, 21, and fast forward to the 1930s, same concept. It was the failure of the financial system in the country. And it wasn't just here. Uh, there was also a huge economic downturn in, the, in Britain, which was why they had elected not to sell it in Britain, because they, too, were facing financial hardships. Uh, steam ship versus steam boat. OK. Length and size of this, can you tell me what that was again? Uh, she was about 93 feet long okay. or so. Great. How does that compare, I'm going to test you here, to the steamboat Arabia out of Kansas City, which was an old paddle wheeler frontier vessel that sank, but I believe it was pretty sizable as well. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys, they were innovators, obviously, at the time. Uh, and the whole aspect of taking a vessel uh, and accommodating it with passengers, I, I think it's fascinating having seen the steamship or steamboat Arabia. I'm, I'm familiar with Arabia. Uh, I'm sure you know the story outside mm -hmm. of supplies for the frontier. They would carry people as well, but to, to, to radically shift, I guess my thought and point, uh, to what these gentlemen attempted to do, was that kind of a, a new innovative way of uh, offering hospitality? Uh, and even though financial ec economics globally impacted, obviously, it's, it's like, did we see it? Uh, a growth uh, in industry uh, itself be created uh, in the passenger vessel uh, arena? Um, you would. The main thing that was driving them as far as steam across the Atlantic, speed. Okay. And in the packet ship service, what a packet is, is any ship that leaves on a determined date to arrive 
hopefully on a determined date, and from there set sail from there and return. You know, regular scheduled service is what they considered a packet. Savannah was originally intended to be a steam packet between the city of Savannah and Liverpool. Her, the original intention and the entire concept was speed because speed equals money. Speed pays. The faster you can transfer passengers or eventually cargo between two ports, the faster you can turn around and get back, it all equals greater financial advantage. So help us understand speed just a little bit more clearly. If I'm the steamboat Arabia and I'm going to sell up uh, the Missouri, uh, what would the typical speed of a paddle wheeler inland be as opposed to a newly outfitted uh, steam vessel? It's, it compare, it's, you're, it's comparing two totally different purposes and uses. Okay. Uh, Steamboats like the Savannah, but not the Savannah, I'm sorry. Like the Arabia, Sultana, any of the steamboats that work the Mississippi River or the Missouri River, those are an entirely different class of vessel from an ocean going steamship. They're designed, they're shallower draft, they're designed for an entirely different purpose, whereas the steamship is a deeper draft and designed for ocean going purposes. So it would have been very luxurious to uh, yes. speed across the uh, you actually would have been a little bit more luxurious on a riverboat. They're longer, they're broader, more passenger accommodation. Savannah itself, when she cro when she was built, was only built for about, like I said, 26 to 60 pass uh, passengers. Okay. And that's, 60 was with people sleeping on couches. Okay. Later on, you would have bigger ships like the Great Eastern, Great Western, the Great Britain, that could carry... 600 passengers, with the birth of the modern passenger liner, really, in the 1860s. It, comparing a steamship to a steamboat is, there's two entirely differently purposed vessels. Thank you. Does that help? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So after the demise of the Savannah, was it, I think you just said it was about the 1860s then when steam travel across the Atlantic began to be successful? About the 1830s, late okay. 1820s, early 1830s. Um, they knew it could be done, it was just waiting on right. it for everything to catch up. Savannah really had the option of really being a wonderful ship if it hadn't been for the financial disasters that struck the country and eventually basically wrecked her. <laughs> Were they, um, you know, piggybacking on this question, the, when, um, in the 1830s, when steam travel across the Atlantic became reliable, was it mixed use passenger and cargo, or was there a mix of strictly passenger, or strictly cargo? All mixed. All mixed. Yep. Um, a lot of, with the later steam packet vessels, it was divided by class, just like it would be later. If they didn't sell enough what they call steerage, which is down in the hold, that space was crammed with cargo. It was almost all mixed use. The uh, 21 to 28 days that the Savannah crossed the Atlantic, mm -hmm. how is that comparable with sailing vessels at the time of the packet size? Um, upwards of two months. Oh. Uh, that when Oglethorpe sailed for Savannah in the end, it was supposed to be a two month trip, it ended up being three. So, and then you, you were you were directed by the winds. The winds could blow great. You could be becalmed. You know, like the poem says, a painted ship upon a painted ocean, sitting there, waiting for the winds, hoping for the winds. And you could go from that to being rocked side to side and taking on water and your sails torn to shreds. Yes, ma'am. I was just wondering, was this a celebrated event? I mean, it seems like a great accomplishment. Did it kind of get lost due to the economy and everybody? Uh, it was a very celebrated event at its time. It was, okay. Oh, yes. Um, she was cheered everywhere she went, from Savannah to St. Petersburg. Every time she made a port between here and St. Petersburg, she was cheered. She was cheered in New York when, she, when they were doing test runs. Um, it did break a lot of people in New York's hearts when she set sail on her maiden voyage from New York to Savannah under sail. 
because they wanted to see her steam out of New York. But Fulton, uh, who actually rocked with the Claremont in the first really efficient steamboat, he and his partner Livingston had actually arranged a monopoly on steam navigation in New York Harbor and up the, the North River. And we're very happy to take anybody who operated a steam vessel to court. So in an effort to appease them and not ruffle feathers, they sailed out of New York. And once they got out of New York, then they switched to steam. Um, it wasn't until probably the first real big celebration. It was probably 100 years afterwards. And then in 1933, National Maritime Day uh, was created by President Roosevelt. Um, on May 22nd, the day she set sail from Savannah, and of course now we're here at the 200th. So. You might want to mention. Oh, yeah. Take a more question. What time So Fulton had a monopoly on the navigation, but not on the building of steamships. Correct. Interesting. Uh, you could build them all day long. You just couldn't sail them. <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> what, new question? This is kind of an aside, but Fulton and Livingston were partners in, in developing steam navigation around Manhattan and in the um, Hudson River. They got the um, New York legislature to pass an act giving them a monopoly on steam navigation in those waters. And Thomas Gibbons, who was from Chatham County, um, he went up to New Jersey and, and uh, set up a steam ship operation from um, New Jersey to Manhattan Island. And um, I believe Fulton's partner by then was Ogden. Um, and uh, they took him to court. And he claimed, Gibbons claimed it was interstate commerce. And so that's where the landmark U.S. Supreme Court decision, Gibbons versus Ogden, came. They said that um, states could not regulate interstate commerce, and therefore Gibbons' steamboat operation was was legitimate. And um, and uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the plantation up the river here. It's where their sugar refinery is. It was his plantation. That's a very interesting fact because it seems like the problem with the Savannah was as much timing than anything else. You know, an inability to, um, because the that court case hadn't come up yet, so an inability to navigate out when people are really excited, the inability to get President Monroe to, to kind of promote this as a new industry, the, um, the timing with the depression. But I'm really intrigued by the fact that they set their sights on St. Petersburg um, because that seems so exotic. Um, was, that, was that considered normal, like for freight, um, for freight ships? Or, or were people actually um, able at that time to buy a, a ticket on a sailing ship, for example, to St. Petersburg, and that was a regular, you know, matter of course event. Uh, no. <laughs> St. Petersburg was selected for a couple of reasons. Um, one, <coughs> Fulton had already tried to sell a ship to the Russians and had failed. Mostly they had failed to get it built, so, and also William Scarborough had been the uh, Council General for Russia in Savannah. And he kind of had an idea that Russia would be the best choice chance of selling the Savannah once that decision had been made to sell the Savannah. Um, originally, like I said, the uh, concept was a packet between here and Liverpool with regular scheduled runs. But with the decision to sell her before she even left, it was decided that Russia was probably the most likely place that they were going to be able to sell her. When did the screw propellers come into fashion? Uh, the first screw propeller was actually the RMS Archimedes, and that was in the 1830s. Was it in 
instantly more efficient? Um, I'm really not up on the Archimedes. No. Well, I mean, but screw propeller. Screw, uh, the screw is a little bit more efficient than power wheels. It absolutely, absolutely is. Uh, which is why you see an eventual turn from power wheel steamers to uh, screw propelled ocean going steamers. Main problem with power wheels uh, in heavy seas, ships rocket back and forth. And so you run into the problem, you got one power wheel down in the water churning away, and the other one's raised up almost above the water, and it makes a ship jerk one way and the other as the, as the ship rocks. So the screw propeller was a, was a definite improvement from that respect. From a visceral perspective, if we were to look out the window today, we can see, uh, I believe it's the Georgia Queen parked out here, mm -hmm. the paddle wheel. If we pull this one up next, next to it, uh, in, in comparison to size, uh, it would be much smaller if I'm perceiving it right than what that boat is out there. That boat's pretty huge. Uh, for the size of that vessel, then that, I was a few minutes late, is, is it a, technically, what's the term for the boat itself is it a schooner that they. It's a it's a four rig ship. Okay, okay. Which means three masts, all square rigged. Okay. And then she had the steam engine. Okay, so it would be comparable to some of the tall masted ships that come in, like today that you see. If it's a full rig ship, yes, sir. Okay, so it'd be pretty big. I'm just trying to think that big. Yeah, she was about 93 feet long, 310 tons. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Ford Museum in uh, Michigan, they've got a collection of steam engines from early 1800s through the 1850s. It's amazing the difference in size and efficiency of steam engines, how much it advanced in that time frame from giant engines that made 10 horsepower to engines that would power diesel locomotives and make uh, several hundred horsepower. Uh, I think that probably. I found this on the web. This discussion a lot. I don't think I quite understood your question. It wasn't a question at all. It oh, just, okay. just, just to the side. All right. Any other questions? I want to make sure everybody is aware of the special celebration coming up next week on Maritime Day at the Ships of the Sea Museum. It's going to be a start at 5.30. Um, it's free admission. Um, and they're going to be celebrating the Steamship Savannah. And you'll see there's a performance by the Paris Island Marine Band. Um, there'll be hors d'oeuvres and beverages and um, lots of good things, including the opening of a new Robert Morris exhibit. So if you have an opportunity to go out on Maritime Day, the actual 200th anniversary next week, I encourage you all to do so.